Thank you, Jackson. Thank you very much. Title of my talk is Behave So We Can Be Have. All plants require pollination in order to both produce, think, fruits, nuts, and vegetables, as well as to reproduce, think, seeds, and next generation plants. There are several different types of pollination, but the most common form is insect pollination. There are many insects that pollinate, and the reason that they do so is because the plant rewards them in the form of both nectar and pollen with which to uh, provide them with fuel as well as food for their young. Like I said, there's many different types of pollinators, but the most efficient and the most effective pollinators on the planet are bees. There are many different bees, too. Here in Colorado, there are over 900 species of resident bees. Most of these bees are solitary bees. They live in little tiny holes in the ground in the hollow stems of reeds. Bees come in all different sizes. Here is a little teeny tiny one. They get bigger and bigger, and some are downright huge. <laughs> bees are all different colors. The upper left bee is a blue orchard bee, which is a great pollinator of fruit trees in this state. The lower right, that peacock there, is a helictidae, or a sweat bee. Bees have pretty unique things that they do. Here is one that's called a leaf cutter bee. She cuts a little dime-sized piece of leaf, carries it back to her nest, lays an egg in there, and collects pollen and nectar to feed that young. This is a squash bee. Squash bees only pollinate squash. The males overnight in the Squash Blossom Hotel, <laughs> and when the plant opens in the morning, they are right there ready for action when that female comes to visit. This is a wool carter bee. She is collecting the fuzz from that plant to make her nest. Most of you recognize this bug here. That's a bumblebee. Bumblebees are huge fuzzy bees, but they're super cool for other reasons besides that. The first reason they're cool is because they're visually identifiable. Secondly, they have a special type of pollination called buzz pollination where they violently vibrate the flower on the plant to release the pollen. There are a couple of uh, plants that require that. Tomatoes and blueberries are two of them. But the workhorse of the pollination world is the honeybee, Apis mellifera. Apis mellifera lives in large social colonies of 30 to 80,000 insects. It is that power in numbers, as well as their fantastic physical design that makes them such a terrific pollinator. Let's take a closer look at Emerson's humble bee. This is her head. These are her large compound eyes that she uses for vision. These are her ocelli. That's her built-in GPS unit. She uses it for navigation. All of the hair that is on her eyes are used to detect wind speed. Effective pollinators are fuzzy. Even a honeybee's fuzz is fuzzy. <laughs> Honeybees collect pollen, and this is an empty pollen basket. It is located on the outside of her rear legs and has these special curving hairs that hold pollen. On her middle legs, she has a specialized comb that she can groom herself and pack pollen into those pollen baskets to carry back to the hive. Honeybees collect nectar, and nectar is how honey is made. She has a special stomach called a honey stomach that she brings nectar back to the hive with. 
This bee here is awfully pink. She's pink because she is raiding the next door neighbor's hummingbird feeder and bringing red sugar water back to the hive. But we have been misbehaving. Pollinators are in peril. Bees of all sorts are dying in droves. Managed honeybee colony losses in this country have averaged over 30% for nearly a decade. This is absolutely unsustainable. Each and every one of you can make a difference to pollinators if you do three things. The first thing that you need to do is get rid of your fear of bees. I know that there's a whole bunch of you that just laughed about that because, because you don't really care about bees. And, and I can stand up here all day long and it's not going to make a rest bit of difference to you. Uh, but uh, you should care about bees, all right? But you don't care about bees because they stink, okay? Well, this is the Western Yellow Jacket. It is not a bee at all. It is what most people think are a bee, but it is not a bee at all. And it is responsible, according to Dr. Cranshaw of CSU, for 90% of the stings within this state. It doesn't even look like a bee. <laughs> okay? Now, bees can sting, and bees do sting, but bees are defensive, not aggressive. So look at the difference between those two insects and remember them. Bees scare you. Really. <laughs> if you're going to be afraid, this is the bug you need to be afraid of. <laughs> yeah, don't try that with a yellow jacket. <laughs> Mosquitoes cause more damage than any other insect on the planet. All right, so... Throughout human history, bees have been absolutely revered. They are the model of industry and productivity. And they set an example for all of us that you can create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. But in the past two generations, we have become a society that both fears and maligns that insect. And we simply must do better. We need to re learn to respect that insect, and we need to do, teach our children to do the same. The second thing you can all do is make better plant choices. Monoculture is the cultivation of large swaths of a single crop. It's rampant in the state. It is government incentivized, and it needs to change. Most monoculture crops are wind pollinates, which means they provide little in the way of nutrition for insects. This is the human dietary equivalent. <laughs> Turf is simply urban monoculture. Turf is the most heavily chemigated crop in this country, and it is no better than its agricultural cousin. In fact, it can one-up its agricultural cousin by providing absolutely no food for insects. This is its rough human dietary equivalent. Bees need floral diversity. They need plants that provide three seasons of nectar and pollen. They need a variety of shapes and colors and sizes. Optimal forage needs to be pesticide free. In addition, it needs to be supported with clean water and adequate housing opportunities. You can plant floral diversity. This is what it would look like if it was your diet. This is a time lawn. Plant one and you won't have to mow anymore. <laughs> plant your health strip with these pollinator plantings. The health strip is the area between your sidewalk and your street that you can't water anyway, so take the water savings and plant your health strip. This is a beautiful artscape in a pollinator planting. Go wild like my friends Evie and Mac. Be patriotic.
but you can't invite insects to your home and then proceed to kill them. We have to have responsible and reduced pesticide application at the same time. The two are inextricably linked. So pesticides that are of important to pollinators are insecticides and herbicides. Insecticides kill insects. There are two different flavors of them. The first is a targeted insecticide where it kills a specific insect and it doesn't really adversely impact pollinators. How many of you were seduced by an ad that said they would solve all your insect woes if you just use this product? You'd never see another bug for another year. Well, congratulations. That there is a broad spectrum insecticide, and a broad spectrum insecticide kills all insects, whether they are beneficial or harmful. In addition to that, you bought a product that has a high residual toxicity. And that means that that product is lethal for a really long time. Insecticide use, broad spectrum insecticide use, kills bees. Improper insecticide use kills lots of bees. Herbicides don't kill bees, they kill plants. And so as such, they kill the food that these insects rely upon. The dramatic decline of monarch populations in this country is directly related to herbicide overuse killing its host plant, the milkweed. As the species at the top of the food pyramid, we should be worried, very worried. We have been targeting the base level of this pyramid with herbicides for as long as I can remember. The next level up is insecticides. We need to change and reduce or eliminate our pesticide use. Make that commitment and start in your home and garden. Get 75 of your neighbors to join in that commitment and get Boulder's Be Safe Neighborhood Project over here in Fort Collins. My friend Gretchen owns a nonprofit called Pollination Planet. Have her come talk to your school kids and your grandkids' schools about pollinators and how important they are. What about here at CSU? This is a picture of Davis's Honeybee Haven. We could have one of those here, but we don't. I think we can do better. Talk to your community government leaders about planting pollinator habitat in parks and open spaces. Get rid of concrete medians. What about a roadside planting program? Colorado doesn't have one. They're beautiful. They support a variety of insect life, and they generate great tourist income. But don't stop there. Support with your money the organizations that are supporting pollinator health. Be healthy. You must behave so we can behave. Thank you.